I understand and I completely credit why women feel a lot of anxiety before negotiating. It is reasonable both because of all the social forces discouraging women from asking, but also because it, it matters to us if it's an important negotiation, we have feelings about it. And that's reasonable and normal. So what I encourage women to do is to role play in advance, to sit down and try to anticipate everything you're scared about, everything that might hurt your feelings, make you mad, embarrass you, maybe make you lose your composure, and then brief a friend or a colleague thoroughly about it and play it through several times. This is Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode number 352 with guest Sarah Lashiver. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad and grateful that you are here. Hey, so I am getting towards the very end of writing my third book, title Still to be Determined. And I only have a few thousand words left to write. And I also, I think I just need one more story from y'all. So if you're listening to this and you are someone who maybe identifies as someone who is an independent woman. So let me finish. Let me explain a little bit more. So I'm looking specifically for someone who really kind of goes over the line into hyper-independence. So I'll give you an example. Maybe you are someone who went through a really difficult time. You maybe struggled with anxiety and depression or went through a really hard breakup or lost your job had to take care of a sick parent, any kind of major life stressor, and you did not reach out for support. You convinced yourself that you could do this on your own. And maybe even, in fact, you are someone who is praised for it. You are acknowledged for being strong and doing things all on your own. And so it maybe has become a pattern of yours. I would love to hear your story and maybe even put it in my book. I'm writing a chapter specifically on this. Head on over to yourkickasslife.com slash story and you will find a quick little questionnaire there. I will not use your first name unless I get explicit permission and I look forward to hearing your story. I think that that might be all that I need for this book. Thank you so much to all of you who have who have filled out that questionnaire for other uh, for other stories that I've needed for this book. You've all been so helpful. And I also just am honored that you trust me with these stories and take the time to do that. Even if it didn't turn out to be one that I used in the book, I am incredibly grateful for your time and your trust. Before I jump into today's conversation, which I'm really excited to bring you, is I think that Liz, my lead coach over here at Your Kick-Ass Life, has one more spot open for one-on-one -on -one coaching. I know many of you listening have come and filled out applications, and some of you have started to work with her. Hi! And I'm just really excited that you are in the best of hands with Liz. I also have one opening if you want to work with me, and I might be shutting that down very soon because going into edits with this book is... Um, kind of the point where I really start to stress out. <laughs> no, the whole thing has been been really great. I'm really surprised that this book has still poured out of me, even during a global pandemic. I don't know what guides and angels are on my side, but they are around, and I thank the universe for that. So you can head on over to yourkickasslife.com slash coaching. Right there, you'll find my page. But if you just fill out an application, we will figure out where the best fit is for you and we'll be in touch. All right. Speaking of the book, I was writing a particular chapter and was doing some research, bought a book and was endlessly fascinated with this book and the research. I was just gobbling it up and knew I had to have one of these authors come on to discuss this topic. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful that Sarah said yes. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. 
Sarah Lashiver is an authority on the challenges that shape women's lives at work. Sarah is the co-author with Linda Babcock of Women Don't Ask, The High Cost of Avoiding Negotiation and Positive Strategies for Change. She and Linda Babcock subsequently wrote Ask For It, a nuts and bolts negotiation training primer for women struggling to overcome the barriers in their path. A highly sought after speaker, Sarah lectures and teaches workshops to corporate audiences, colleges and universities, law firms, government agencies, and women's leadership conferences in the U.S. and around the world. So without further ado, here is Sarah. Sarah, thank you so much for being here on the show today. It is my pleasure. As people can probably sense, my excitement over here, and as I was telling you before we started recording, I stumbled upon your work. I believe there are no accidents when it comes to things like this. In a Google search looking for, I think I might have Googled, um, why don't women ask for what they want? And mm. your work came up. The The books that you've written, you've, you've co-authored with Linda Babcock and... I want to jump right in because I have some questions that I know that my audience is going to be just salivating to know more about your work. All right. So let's start with women in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And what are some common obstacles that women specifically have in the workplace when it comes to really anything like I'm just gonna leave it real broad because I know this is like you know I don't want to be too big specific. Topic. it is huge I know it's like how much time you got and not only tell us about the the specific obstacles that they have but can you talk a little bit about some ways in which they can overcome them sure well you know it's speaking broadly there is a lot of research showing that people both men and women don't associate the word manager or leader with women um, they're more likely to think of women as related more to kind of home home stuff and men career stuff. And there are a couple of different famous studies that show that, that even if you or I did those studies, we would probably come up with the same result because we are all socialized from a very young age to think that women should be taking care of other people and men should be advancing their own interests. And that is a model that has that, that persists even today. So there's that piece. Uh, then that kind of you know, permeates the workplace in a lot of ways that are hard to see. For example, uh, when people who believe they have no prejudice, no problem with women in the workplace are given their work to evaluate, given work by men and women to, to evaluate, they rate the women's work as inferior to that of the men's, even if the work is identical, the work product is the same. Oh my gosh. So, um, and there are these famous uh, studies where they will send resumes to college professors or hiring managers, and the only thing different about the resumes is the gender identifiability of the names. It's a female name, it's a male name. And the men are more likely to be given an uh, uh, interview, be recommended, uh, to be hired, there will be offered more, you know, if they're offered the job. And that is true of women professors, women people in management too, less likely to give those opportunities to people whose names sound like women's names. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a lot of other factors that contribute to women you know, having trouble getting ahead. There's a recent study that just came out talking about uh, uh, performance reviews and that men are more likely to get kind of constructive criticism in performance reviews, while people are more likely to kind of soften, be a little vaguer, and be a little nicer to women, which mm. goes along with this idea that, you know, women are insecure, women don't have any confidence, uh, but the net result is women aren't getting the constructive guidance. The feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, that kind of leads me to just my own curiosity. And I read a little bit about this when I came across your work. And how did you how did you get into this work? Did you seek this out or was it an accident? How did you get here? <laughs> well, it, there's two main parts of that. One is I have always been interested in women's lives and careers. I uh, grew up with a mother who worked up till the day her first kid was born 
took, you know, had four kids the day my sister, her youngest, started kindergarten. She went back to work, but she didn't get the opportunities, the promotions that she clearly had earned, and that was frustrating. Uh, so I'm just interested. Also, my life, my opportunities, different from hers, different from those of women in earlier generations, but. We didn't make the progress we thought we were going to make nearly as fast or, you know, as far as we thought we were going to go. So super interested, started out early in my career writing about women in the arts, writing about women in the sciences, women in academia, and ended up writing a lot about women in business. So fast forward a number of years, Linda Babcock, who is a behavioral economist at Carnegie Mellon, was a visiting professor at the Harvard Business School, and I live in the Cambridge area. And she'd had this observation about her graduate students that the male graduate students would come and ask for something they thought would help them get ahead, be good for their careers, help them you know, develop their teaching skills, whatever it was. And then the women would come and say, how come you gave that to him and you didn't give that to me? And Linda realized it was just because she hadn't noticed that the men were asking and the women weren't asking. Hmm. So she thought about some similar things that had happened uh, as she, she was director of the, I think it was the graduate PhD program, something at the Heinz College at Carnegie Mellon at the time. Similar things that had happened where men had asked for something, women had complained or expressed surprise that uh, they hadn't been offered the same thing. And she thought maybe there's a book here, but she didn't want to write it herself, didn't think she had the skills to write something that would appeal to a popular audience as opposed opposed to something for an academic Mm -hmm. monograph, something like that. And uh, she met, I guess she met a a literary agent at a cocktail party and was talking about her idea. And this woman said, oh, you know, yes, this sounds fantastic. Let's do something. And then she asked around for um, recommendations of writers who were interested in women's lives. So I then went and you know, she came up with my name. I went and met Linda. I thought, this is great material. I did, I should say, grow up with a father who said his big piece of advice to both his sons and daughters, where there were two of each of us, uh, don't take no for an answer the first three times. Hmm. And that's actually a pretty good a pretty good rule of thumb. I do have people when I speak raise their hand and say, "Well, what about no? Don't you understand?" And what I understand about no is that it's often an opening gambit, or it's often the answer of an unimaginative person <laughs> that if uh-huh. you keep talking, you might find uh, that it is possible for them to give you what you want, and that you can brainstorm together or look at the barriers, the impediments, and figure out ways to remove them. Them, lower them. That mm-hmm. kind of thing. So this re- research that you did with Linda, was this in the 1990s? Is that correct? It was in the early, early 2000s. Okay. Um, and, and it's grown and from there. It's grown from there. I mean, it kicked off a whole area of research. And so many people have done work on this uh, since then. But this really kind of broke that story wide open that women are not actually asking nearly as much as men do. It was something we all kind of probably sensed without focusing on it. But Linda's research really confirmed that that is the case. Right. Okay. So you you briefly mentioned about the biases that people have, you know, towards women in the workplace. So can you talk to us a little bit more specifically about the impact of that subconscious bias on women in the workplace? Well, if we're looking at it in terms of negotiation, women know that People don't like it, excuse me, when women come off as too aggressive. Right. And it's true. Women don't like it. When other women come off as too aggressive, men really don't like it. And so we think of negotiation as a a kind of aggressive interaction. Give me what I want. You know, Mm -hmm. I deserve this. An argument. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And. So women avoid it because they think that's a bad strategy. That's there's going to be a bad backlash, and that's not the only choice. The choice is not negotiate, elicit a backlash, do damage to your career and your relationships, or be be silent. And so, through my many many interviews and the research Linda did, we figured out that actually women can ask for things that they want. They can negotiate if they do it in ways that are different from our perceived ideas about negotiating and different from the male model. 
Mm-hmm. And that's uh, and that's where we really focused a lot of our attention, especially in the second book, Ask For It. The first book is Women Don't Ask. And Women Don't Ask is kind of the social science behind all this. And Ask For It is, you know, this is how women can do it. Teaching better. women how to negotiate. I yeah. love that. I and, I and I was reading that in your work when I first found you and that way, I think as women, just generally speaking here, we think we need to do it like the men do. And yeah. I started thinking about my own history in the workplace. And there are two women bosses that I had that stand out the most to me. They were successful. They were ambitious. One of them was the vice president of a company that I worked for and they were terrifying and I did not like them. And it's, and I think about this, like, had they been a man and acted the same way, I probably would have had a different view. I can almost guarantee you I would have had a different view of them because just of their gender. And I and I really thought about it and thought, okay, well, that's my that was my own subconscious bias at work. But then also, so this was in the 1990s. But I also think, I wonder if they were kind of, and I, I hate to judge, but like maybe they were kind of doing it wrong. Maybe they were approaching their own management position and their own management style. Maybe it could have been a little bit different. So can you speak to that a little bit? I know I kind of touched on a, a couple of different things there. We often hear, I often hear people say, oh, the worst boss I ever had was a woman. Or, right. uh, you know, how do I ask a boss who has this kind of you know, fierce demeanor for what I want? And about the, you know, worst boss I ever had was a woman. I think you're absolutely right. That behavior that in men would go unremarked mm-hmm. or we would say, oh, he's just goal focused or he doesn't suffer fools gladly or he has his eye on the prize or whatever. Um, in a woman, we we pull up short and we we mark it. And that so we mark so oh, all these women that weren't supportive uh, in the way we expect women um, to be supportive. And we don't mark all the men who weren't supportive. And so it's this we get to, you know, mean girls and queen yeah. bees and uh, all of those stereotypes. When I've talked to men in who work on Wall Street, hedge fund managers, and they're like, yeah, we're all sharks. We'll stab each other in the back <laughs> without blinking. But in men, that's like, yeah, that's just men. Um, right. You know, a woman who did that, we wouldn't like. So, um, so yes. Now, as for the scary bosses you had earlier in your career, I think there is some indication that women of, uh, you know, uh, kind of squarely in the middle of the boomer generation who had to claw and scratch their way uh, to the top, who Mm -hmm. really had to fight very hard against terrible odds and lots of, uh, lots of trouble that it was a little hard for them to make it easier for the women who came behind them, that they were like, yeah, I had to, you know, whatever, why should it be easier for you? Or they just thought that's the way things had to be. And they did imitate male styles a little bit more probably than was necessary. Or maybe it was necessary then, but it isn't anymore. Mm -hmm. It's, It's funny because looking back on it, I know as a young woman, so I was in my 20s then and just starting out in my career, there was a part of me that wanted to be like them. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> well, you know, we look to the role models we have. Right. That's true. <laughs> that's, that's true. true. I, I admired their tenacity and their ambition and where they had gotten in their career, but there was still a part of me that was intimidated, scared, and thought they were mean and cold. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we expect women to be caretaking. We expect yep. women to mm-hmm. support other women. And those women probably weren't that great to the men who worked for them either. Probably not. But, you know, but the, the younger men didn't have that expectation that they would be taken care of by another woman. And uh, whatever, I think that has changed. There is research suggesting that women who can move between both styles, a more male command and control, direct, I'm the decision maker style, and a more female, close listening, you know, eliciting a lot of uh, input, trying to bring people along with her, that women who can move between those two are the most effective leaders, even more effective uh, than men who try to, to try to do both. So that's an interesting paradigm to aim for. Sometimes you need to be the decision maker. Sometimes you need to say, 
I've heard enough and this is what we're going to do. Mm. But the, mm -hmm. the listening closely actually means that women leaders tend to make better decisions because they take into account more data. They get people to buy into the decisions they make. And so uh, their decisions are more effective, more successful because people are behind them. They get people to support their visions. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I, and as, as I was saying, there's a large part of this audience who who does have, you know, they either work a nine to five job or they are entrepreneurs and they have teams. So they're, they're in sort of a management position. And mm -hmm. I, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit. And for the women listening who want to have their, their professional lives more fulfilling, what I hear a lot is that women tend to struggle with naming their accomplishments, really honing in on what their specific talents are. So when women are going through that process of evaluating their talents and, and targeting, you know, what they can come to a manager or a boss with and saying like, okay, here's, here's what I bring to the table and I would like to make more money or I would like to have this promotion or whatever it is. How, how can women go through that process a little bit easier? What's your advice on that? Well, one way to think about it is we call that your value proposition. When you go in and make, make an ask, uh, what is your value proposition? Your value proposition isn't, you know, I, I'm good, I want more money, or I've, you know, gotten a good performance review, uh, you know, I want more money. It really is, if you give me what I'm asking for, I can make you look good, or I can help achieve the group's goals or the you know organizations the institutions long-term strategy whatever so if, if you think about it that way then you start thinking about well I have this particular experience I worked with this demographic before or I led a similar initiative or I have some background that makes me particularly qualified to do this thing I want to do uh, and that will be good for you. That will help us advance the shared goals of whatever the group is that you're part of. And that can be, a, it's a little more of an instrumental way of thinking about what your accomplish, uh, accomplishments are, right? How do I match up what the, the group wants, what those, whatever, long-term goals are? How do I match up what I've already accomplished? And when people look at it that way, it's like, hmm, I actually mm -hmm. will be really good at this. And this is why, and mm -hmm. that's that's where um, that's where you want to go with it. Another completely different approach is if you were going to make a recommendation to your best friend or your sister or a colleague, a female colleague um, you really respect or admire, what would you tell them to say if they had the experience you have? Because we're really pretty good at estimating what other people's work is worth. It's just when it comes to thinking about what we deserve or what we've earned that we run into trouble. So if we can distance it a little and imagine, you know, we're like, you've done this and that. What about, mm -hmm. you know, such mm -hmm. and such? Talk about that. That can be a, a good little psychological trick to get you there. Yes. I was thinking that when you first started answering about, you know, team up with a coworker who knows your mm -hmm. work intimately and and be transparent and be vulnerable and ask. And I... I love that. Thank you so much for that. Well, it brings me to my next question directly related because you have a book called How Women Can, Can Use the Power of Negotiation to Get What They Really Want. Here's, here's the thing that really knocked my socks off when I was reading mm -hmm. your research and about how women, the research that you did showed that women tend to not... And, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even going to say the data cause I'll mess it up. But the, what I, what I remember is the conclusion was that women tend to not negotiate their very first salary from in their very first yeah. job that can end up costing them up to what was it like a half a million dollars at the end of their career or something like that. Well, the half a million dollars number is actually kind of low. <laughs> It's oh my gosh. Based on people who are start out in quite, you know, low earning professions and, you know, end up not making nearly as much as some professional women who start out higher and go higher. But the general idea is just this one negotiation. So let's look at the data, that, that example, that model is you have a couple of young people, a man, a woman, and they're whatever, 22 entering the workforce and they're both offered $25,000 as a starting salary. So super low, right? And she says, oh, thank you. Thank you for giving me a job. And he says, 
can you do a little better? And he negotiates, gets the offer raised to Mm $30,000. So assuming they never negotiate again, they both get equivalent percentage raises over the next, whatever, 43 years of their careers, 3% rate, they average 3% annual increases with each increase being calculated as a percentage of what they were earning before the gap between what he's making and what she's making widens dramatically. And if you think about it, say he continues to live on whatever she's living on, the 25 grand and it's, you know, cumulative growth and invest the difference, you know, whatever the first year it would be five grand, the next year, five grand and change, you know, um, by the time he's ready to retire, because he's earned more every single year, he's going to have uh, over five hundred thousand dollars in his account, and of course, if they start out making sixty and seventy or something like that, it can be. I mean, there are you know great models where it can be a lot more money than that. Yeah, I read that and it hit me like a ton of bricks because <laughs> I think back on that job, my my very first job, and I was twenty two. Mm-hmm. And it was with that company I told you that had the vice president who was a woman who kind of scared mm-hmm. me, but I kind of wanted to be like her. They offered mm-hmm. me $27,000 as an assistant buyer for a chain of retail stores. I didn't even, I mean, it didn't even fathom that I could negotiate that salary. I was mm-hmm. thankful. Like, just like you said, okay, thank mm-hmm. you so much. And I was so excited. And I had my own desk. I had my own phone. Like those were the things <laughs> more exciting to me. Oh my gosh. But, and, and I asked about this. It was interesting. I I just casually asked about this on my personal Facebook page. And one woman replied and said that she did negotiate her very first salary and got like 7,000 more a year or something like that because she had read, I wonder if she read your book or saw some of your work or something. She said she read a quote about that and that's what made her ask for it. And she had no idea. Her parents hadn't taught her, nobody else. And I thought, this is so important. Like, oh my gosh. I, I mean, how does, where would, so the people listening to this are probably thinking, okay, that's fantastic news. How would I even, so can you give us a little bit of advice of how would someone even approach that conversation in that very first negotiation? Well, you start with doing your research and find out what they're uh, what they're offering other people who are starting. And you can do that if it's a publicly traded company. Be a lot of information uh, available through the job websites, Indeed, Monster.com, but also places like Salesforce.com. Um, uh, PayScale is good. Glassdoor is good. Um, we and then you you know talk to your own personal networks. If you are graduating from a college where other people may have gotten a similar job, you know, go through career services, go to your alumni office, you know, whatever friends of friends, anybody who can give you a sense of what they do. So quick story. When Women Don't Ask, our first book uh, came out, Linda Babcock and I were sent on a book tour and we gave a presentation at Microsoft in Redmond, Washington at their headquarters. And afterwards, a young woman came up to me and she said, well, you know, I was hired straight out of graduate school and I tried to negotiate a little and they said, no, that's what we pay everyone who's starting out. And so I said, okay. And six months later, I discovered that three men who'd uh, been hired uh, negotiated and got 10 grand more than I did. And she said, how was I supposed to know that their no wasn't a real no? And I said, well, how many people from your graduate school have been hired by Microsoft in the last 10 years? And she said, oh, three or four people every year. And I said, well, I am sure your alumni office or career services office would have been willing to put you in touch with some of those people. And they would have told you, yeah, yeah, they always say a no, push a little harder and you can get more. Plus, I said, this is Redmond, Washington. Every barista in town probably could have told you that. So... (laughs) You know, think about where you can get that information. So, all right, so now you have the information, you know, what do you go and you assume that they are offering you less than they can afford to pay because they expect people to negotiate. And rather than say, well, I know that you pay other people more or that this this is my data, you say, you know, this is a great job. I would love to work here. Uh, I've done a little research. I have a sense that there's some flexibility in the salary. I was hoping to get whatever your number is, aim a little higher than what you're really hoping to get. What do you think? Mm -hmm. So don't come off as too aggressive. Again, women 
that aggressive uh, stance actually doesn't work very well. But if you do it in the context of, I'd love to work, it's some flattery, people love to be flattered, it's a great yes. job, you seem like you'd be a great boss, but I'm hoping I can do a little better. And then pause and wait for them to reply. Don't fill the space. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes. I'm gonna be like, oh, well, if you can't do that, never mind. You, you know, and we do we, I call that letting it land. In my, in my life coaching school, that's what they say. Like, let it fly and then let it land. Yeah, yeah. Just take a breath and let them think about it. And if they say, even if they, it's very uncomfortable, even if they say, oh, well, I'm not sure that this, that, the other thing, you could even say, would you mind thinking about it? And maybe we can talk again tomorrow. And they think about, they've made you the offer. You're their first choice. They want you. They think about overnight, they might, they might come up with a little more money. Oh, that's fascinating. It, you know, for the sake of total transparency, I don't know a whole lot of, about negotiation. I bought one of those masterclass. Do you know about those? Like the masterclass.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a guy on there that, that is a specialist in negotiating and, and getting what you want. And it's the psychology of it is fascinating. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm learning so much over here. I'm so excited. Okay. I, I, I really mm-hmm. also wanted to ask you because this show and actually the, the women that read my book, I'm, I'm now covering four generations because I have women in their early and mid twenties who are in generation Z. So mm-hmm. is, is, have you found in your research that women who struggle with negotiations are typically Gen Xers who are my age or the baby boomer generation, or is it still a problem for younger women as well? Well, Linda's research suggests that, uh, in fact, the difference in the rate of asking between men and women of younger generations and older women is a little bit greater because older women have been in the workforce long enough to kind of get the memo or to, you know, there's a learning curve and it's slow and, pardon me, uh, steep and they don't necessarily get all the way there, but they've kind of figured out. They're just tired of it. And they're like, okay. (laughs) Right. They don't have as much um, patience. <laughs> you know, and the risk for younger women, and, you know, there are you know, exceptions, uh, of course, is that the culture of school has changed a lot in the last three decades. So that girls are much more successful in school than boys. They graduate uh, at higher rates. They graduate more at the tops of their classes. They go on to college at higher rates. The college population is about 60, 40 female mm-hmm. now. They go on to master's professional degrees. Uh, and so women think when they enter the workforce, I know how to be successful. I'll just do a great job. Mm-hmm. I'll cross every T, dot every I, I'll get the equivalent of the A or the A+. Plus. And so women don't think they need to ask for the recognition they've earned. They think it will come to them because, ha ha, this is a meritocracy. Yeah. Um, and so they haven't gotten that message and the culture of work has not changed in the ways the culture of school has changed. So that is not enough. You really do need to raise your hand. And often younger women will say, I'm sure I'm asking for everything my male peers are. And when you do the, you know, drill down a little, it turns out they don't know what their male peers are asking for and their male peers are asking for more. So in other words, there's still a lot of work to be done. (laughs) There is still a lot of work to be done. I am glad that the because of our work, the message has gotten out there. Yes, in, people are more aware of it, I think. People are more aware of it. But it's still scary and it's still hard. And I don't mean to suggest that just asking is a panacea, that you'll always get what you want. But there's a lot to be said for learning how to do it in the ways that work well for women. So your books are in the show notes for people listening. And I, I love that you also have a book that's uh, more or less a how-to to negotiate in in the workplace. Do you do you does your research cover or your work cover at all about negotiations in women's personal lives? A little bit. A little bit. There is of course less research because it's hard to follow people around with a clipboard in their private lives. Right. But there are studies for example that show that women who have families and work full time still do between 2 thirds and 3 quarters of the housework and childcare and there's some suggestion that that's not because their male partners are trying to scam them. It's that the male partners really don't see everything that women do. And if women don't ask, if they don't say, hey, you know, we both decided to have these kids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we mm-hmm. both decided to, you know, whatever, buy this. Uh, Cohabitate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is what it takes to keep it all running the way we want it to run. Let's look at all those tasks and divvy them up. Uh, a little bit more equitably. And men are often, you know, pretty ready to help out. I don't think we usually see 
pairs, you know, whatever, uh, couples getting to 50-50, and men do tend to overestimate how much they're doing. There's research to support that. Isn't that right? <laughs> there is. Yeah. There is. Okay. But, but still... Um, it's good to talk to talk to your male partners, assuming you have a, a male partner. Same sex couples actually do divide the work more equitably. There, uh, there's also research that shows that when women make a lot less than their partners, they have less power in a relationship. And for example, and this is a, a fairly extreme example. This is not new research, but in Haiti, I think it was, where women often do you know, tons of unpaid work in the home, but the men are the ones who bring in the actual cash. Uh, it is difficult for women to ask men to wear condoms. And this is, you know, Haiti had a big AIDS epidemic once yeah. upon a time. So not being able to ask for and get that very basic form of protection was actually killing women. Mm. And even in, let me just add, even in, you know, whatever, young adults in the U.S., it can be hard for uh, for young women to ask their male partners to wear condoms. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that brings me to something I've been curious about as well. And you know, the majority of my listeners are here in the states and in Canada, like over in this direction. And does what does the research report for women of color in the workplace in how they are either perceived when they ask for what they want or salary, or, or really just kind of the floor is open for you to talk about that if you if you have any research to share. Yeah, there is not, I mean, well, let me show you there are a couple of interesting things that I know about. I know there is not enough research in that area and that more is being done now, but the basic message of the work that's been done is that anything that compounds your minority status, so you're a woman and you're LGBTQ, you're a woman and you're first generation immigrant, you're a woman and a person of color, makes it that much harder mm-hmm. to advocate for yourself in this way. There is, however, a, some research, I, Robert Livingston, I think he's still at Harvard, did that shows that the stereotype of the sassy black woman mm-hmm. can actually give a woman with that personality, a, a, a woman of color with that personality, maybe a little bit of uh, more whatever breathing room around it, um, which is whatever. Uh, which is our unconscious bias and stereotypes yes. and mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. all at work. Interesting. Well, you are just a treasure trove of research and information and science. And I thank you so much. Before we close, is there anything that I left out that that you love to make sure that that people know when you're when you're being interviewed? Well, I, I understand that I completely credit why women feel a lot of anxiety before negotiating. It is reasonable both because of all the social forces discouraging women from asking, but also because it it matters to us if it's an important negotiation, we have feelings about it. And that's reasonable and normal. So what I encourage women to do is to role play in advance, to sit down and try to anticipate everything you're scared about, everything that might hurt your feelings, make you mad, embarrass you, maybe make you lose your composure, and then brief a friend or a colleague thoroughly about it and play it through several times and get them to really push your buttons, hurt your feelings, whatever, make you mad. Make you mad. And then (laughs) (laughs) practice calm responses that move things away from whatever those flashpoints are towards the joint problem solving that is the best mode of negotiating. You have some things that I want. Here are some things I can do for you. We have some shared interests. Let's, uh, Let's figure out how to make it all happen. And that can be great for a couple of reasons. One is if the thing that you're worried about actually happens, you're prepared, you know mm-hmm. what, you know, the calm response you want to have, but it also won't s- surprise you and therefore trigger the emotion because it will have already been triggered in the role play. Yeah. And it turns out it is the surprise as much as the feeling itself that tends to derail us. We're like, oh, I'm ups- I don't know what I, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and we just want to get out of there. And Words get so caught in our throat. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we take whatever's on the table and, and say things. It's a big conversation. And, and I love that you advise <laughs> that, you know, practice, practice, practice. Like that is not a conversation you want to go into cold. Right, right. There's a truism. I quote this all the time. Uh, you know, when it comes to negotiation, people don't plan to fail. They fail to plan. Yes. The more prep you do beforehand, the more successful you will be. 
So the books are Women Don't Ask, The High Cost of Avoiding Negotiation and Positive Strategies for Change, as well as Ask For It, How Women Can Use the Power of Negotiation to Get What They Really Want. Did I get it right? Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. Those links are in the show notes, everyone. This has been such a treat to have you on and talk about this that is so incredibly important. And everyone listening, thank you so much for your time. You know how grateful I am and I just know how valuable your time is. So thank you for choosing to spend it with me and my guests here on the show. And until next time, everyone, I will see you out in cyberspace. Bye-bye. 